Okay, now begin this conference with Our Lady's Faith, the virtue of faith. Virgo Fidelis, Virgin Most Faithful. So what is faith? This is from Father John Hardin's Modern Catholic Dictionary, which is very good, and you can find it online. The acceptance of the word of another. The acceptance of the word of another, what somebody else says. Trusting that one knows what the other is saying, so they've got knowledge, and is honest in telling the truth and wants to communicate the truth to you. The basic motive of all faith is authority. It is authority. Or the right to be believed of the person who is speaking. So we think about human faith. You go to your doctor and he examines you and he tells you that you're very ill but you feel fine. Okay, He says you're actually not well and if you don't do this, that, and that then things aren't going to go well. Do we do it? Do we do it? Do we take the medicine? Do we put into practice what he says? We do, even though we feel fine at the time, because of the authority of the person who is speaking to us. Or, if your doctor gives signs of incompetence. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, comedian Brian Regan. Have you ever seen any of his stuff? Okay, so he has this little skit about... He goes uh, into his doctor's appointment, and the doctor has, you know, the white blouse uh, slash gown that doctors wear, and it buttons up, and and he's uh, he's joking about how the doctor actually has the buttons misaligned, and he's like, okay, if he can't get his buttons straight, do I really want to entrust my health to him? <laughs> so, there may be signs of incompetence. You know, and what does that do? It causes you to lack faith, okay, in what he tells you. Because he seems like he doesn't have the knowledge. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And therefore, his authority, or to, you know, to speak authoritatively on the subject matter, you know, he, you kind of uh, are discerning the matter. Or, if someone... Uh, has lied to you in the past, right? Your faith in what they say is going to uh, waver, right? That's actually prudent. <laughs> That's where prudence comes in. Whether it be with an incompetent doctor or whether it be with a liar, you know, to take what they say with a grain of salt is actually prudent. All right. On the other hand, if Somebody has demonstrated, you know, I'm thankful. I remember when I, at the last friary, yeah, I guess it was the last friary I was assigned to in, uh, in Connecticut, I had a doctor who was super competent. I mean, that's a real blessing. When you find a doctor who is just, you know, um, conveys that type of competence, Right. That's a great thing. And so, put a lot of faith in, in what he has to tell you with regard to your health. Um, same thing if we know somebody who is morally upright, you know, uh, then we have every reason in the world uh, to believe them. All right, so, so that we're led to give a lot of human faith to these persons, right? Who are competent and morally upright. Uh, they have a right to be believed. So the authority is adequate knowledge of what he or she is talking about, the integrity in not wanting to deceive. Now, in relation to God, right? omniscient, he knows everything. 
God is truth, right? This is Jesus. I am the truth. Nobody ever spoke like this man. Whoever made that claim before? People have said, I know the truth. Nobody's ever claimed to be the truth. So this is why the Catechism says that we believe what God has revealed, okay, and we have faith in what he has revealed because he can neither deceive nor be deceived. He has maximum authority. So the reality is we can't believe too much. Our faith cannot be too firm in what God has promised, in what his word says. All things work for the good for those who love God. That's what the word of God says. That is absolute 100% truth. So if I'm doing my part, striving to love God, I can have 100% confidence that everything that divine providence says my way, sends my way, is for my good. Now, Our Lady knows this better than anyone else. She knows that God is omniscient, knows everything. She knows that God is the truth. So her faith is maximum. Blessed art thou who hast believed, because those things shall be accomplished that were spoken to thee by the Lord. So first we look at Our Lady's faith at the Annunciation. Mary, though vowed to virginity, receives the Archangel Gabriel's announcement with faith. Now remember, Abraham is called our father in faith. Why? Two reasons above all. Does anybody remember? Two acts of faith that Abraham made that make him the, our father in faith. That's one, the sacrifice of Isaac. And it's similar to what happens with Our Lady here because the promise was that through Isaac he would be, become the father of many nations. But then he receives the command to sacrifice his son. So what does he do? He reasons according to faith. He says, okay, let me add this up. I'm supposed to be the father of many nations through him. Now I'm being called to sacrifice him to God. That must mean that God can raise the dead, you know, or raise up nations from the dead. God is going to figure that out. I'm going to obey in faith. The other time, which is beforehand, is when he's called to leave his country, not knowing where he would go. And so he went out in faith. So that's the thing. We need to reason by faith. That's what Our Lady does here. She has a vow of virginity. Now she's told that she will have a son. Okay, how's that going to happen? How does that work? You see, she wouldn't have asked the question if she didn't intend to keep her vow of virginity, which she understood to be the will of God. And now God wants me to be mother. Okay. I guess God can do that. And God does do that, right? This is a miracle. This is a miraculous conception. Our Lady's conception was immaculate, but not miraculous. It was a natural conception, but immaculate. Our Lord's conception is miraculous by the power of the Holy Spirit. This, as St. Irenaeus, along with many other fathers, point out, is in sharp contrast with Eve's disbelief. All right, meditate on that, Eve's disbelief. Why? Because God said... 
But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Word of the Lord. Absolute truth can neither deceive nor be deceived. So why are you doubting that, Eve? Why are you doubting that? You need to have a dogmatic faith, Eve. But instead, Eve gave credence to the serpent. He's a liar. From the beginning, the father of lies. So, yeah, not worthy of credence, the devil, evil spirits. They are liars. Now, they do have adequate knowledge. They are knowledgeable. But they have the intent to deceive. And therefore, not worthy of placing our trust and confidence, our faith in them. So the serpent says, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. There is a lot there that you can unpack, a lot of subtlety. Okay, a lot of subtlety. And let's say it, we see that in our own culture today. Okay, I'm thinking specifically uh, with the what the Second Vatican Council calls the unspeakable crime of abortion. Unspeakable crime. Okay, look, look at that movement and everything surrounding it and the language that they use. I mean, it is just subtle and deceptive. It's awful. It has evil written all over it. So Eve, she gave credence to the serpent. You know, he sowed a seed of doubt, and she started to waver. And then she eventually gives in. She succumbs. Not Our Lady. Not Our Lady. So at the Annunciation, Our Lady certainly showed faith. Let it be done unto me according to your word. God's will be done. Now, Our Lady's faith throughout our Lord's life. The Most Holy Virgin had more faith than all men and angels. So this is from a 17th century Jesuit by the name of Francisco Suarez. She saw her son in the crib of Bethlehem and believed him the creator of the world. She saw him fly from Herod, and yet believed him the king of kings. She saw him born, and yet believed him eternal. She saw him poor and in need of food, and believed him to be the Lord of the universe. She saw him lying on the straw, and believed him omnipotent. She observed that he did not speak, and she believed him to be infinite wisdom. She heard him weep, and believed him to be the joy of paradise. Lastly, she saw him in death, despised and crucified, and although faith wavered in others, Mary remained firm in the belief that he was God. So that is what the church teaches. Uh, it's either in, right there in the catechism, I think, uh, that Our Lady did not doubt at the foot of the cross. She never doubted. Good evidence of that is she didn't go to the tomb with the other women to anoint the body. Where is Our Lady? She's at home praying because she knows that our Lord said that the Son of Man must suffer and die, and on the third day he will rise again. She was pondering these words in her heart. 
The apostles didn't understand when our Lord said that. It doesn't mention whether Our Lady understood or not, but for sure she pondered that in her heart and evidently understood enough not to go to the tomb. He said he would rise on the third day. St. Leo the Great applies the words of Proverbs to Our Lady's faith. Proverbs chapter 31 verse 18 says, Her lamp shall not be put out in the night. That is, the night that our Lord was betrayed, the darkness that ensued. Her lamp of faith was not put out. Now, the virtue of faith implies action, right? So, by faith, Abraham was credited with righteousness, says the scriptures. I think that's the letter to the Hebrews. But not a dead faith. This was a faith that acted. Right? When he was told to leave his country, what, what kind of faith would it be if he didn't leave? Well, it wouldn't be faith. What kind of faith would it be if he didn't march up that hill with his son Isaac, going to the place of sacrifice? If he just hung out in, at home and said, yeah, I believe, but we'll just stay right here. So faith implies action. It implies obedience. St. Gregory the Great says, he truly believes who puts what he believes into practice. And if you say that you believe and don't put it into practice, you won't be believing for long. Because again, virtues like the muscles, if they're not exercised, they don't grow, but they wither away. So our faith can grow, should grow, from day to day throughout our lives as we're making acts of faith and putting faith into practice and living according to faith. St. Augustine says, You say I believe. Do what you say, and it is faith. Do what you say, and it is faith. So again, this brings us back to the abortion topic, right? Because we have... Catholic politicians out there who say they're Catholic and believe and even practicing. And yet, not so fast. You say, I believe, do what you say, and it is faith. To have a lively faith means to live by faith. The scripture says, the just man will live by faith, Hebrews 10.38. So Our Lady lived very differently than those who do not live according to what they profess to believe. And whose faith is dead, as St. James says, Letter of James, chapter 2, verse 26. Faith without works is dead. St. Alphonsus Liguori says that the greater portion of Christians are such only in name. Only in name. The greater portion. And why? because they don't live according to what they profess to believe. He says, in a sense, they are like madmen who should be locked up because they believe that the good will be eternally rewarded and the bad eternally punished and live as if they don't believe it at all. This always reminds me of um, when I was a seminarian in Italy and the custom in, those, in that time, maybe still today, probably still today, 
of blessing the homes during Easter time. Uh, that was the custom. So too many homes for the pastor to go and bless all the homes. So the seminarians were sent out to the, the parishes uh, to walk around the neighborhoods and bless the homes. And I remember ringing the doorbell. Okay, this was, I can even remember the town and probably the neighborhood where I was and uh, ringing the doorbell. And the, the response was, um, non siamo praticanti. We're not practicing. We don't practice. You know, implying that they believe, but they just don't practice, right? Oh, well, why would you do that? I mean, just like St. Alphonse says, if you, if you believe, you like, one of the things that we believe is that those who don't practice are eternally lost. <laughs> That's one of the things that we believe. So do you believe that? Then you're like a madman, just like San Alfonso says, who should be locked up. So we're not practicing the faith. Okay, I'll call the uh, hospital. We'll, we'll bring you and lock you up. St. Teresa of Avila says that all sins come from a lack of faith. Okay, we saw that Eve's sin, okay, there was a lack of faith there. We also see the very, you know, in this discussion, we've seen the very intimate connection between faith and obedience. And that's another passage from Scripture, right? St. Paul says that, we are striving to bring all nations to the obedience of faith. Which, you know, doesn't imply slavery. It doesn't imply a lack of freedom. Actually, on the contrary. Jesus said, the truth will make you free. The truth will make you free. So we should want to live according to the truth. So what about us? Do we believe? Do we live according to what we profess to believe? Again, one of the things that we profess to believe is that God is omniscient. He knows everything. That he is all-powerful. Nothing escapes his control. So he sees everything, knows everything, is in control of everything, and that he is all good. That everything that he permits or wills is good. That's what faith tells us. That should enable us to live our daily lives with great peace, Confidence, trust. And we have a Father who is in heaven. Okay, before we go on to Mary's hope, does anybody have any questions about Our Lady's faith? Whether she was really seduced or just deceived, is that or is, what, what's the difference between that? Was she seduced by the devil or beguiled by him, or did she just believe the lie? Well, I would say there's probably all of that going on. You know, we can't. Uh, let's put it this way: Eve cannot claim invincible ignorance. Right. So someone who through no fault of their own uh, does some action which is objectively sinful, that's called a material sin. A material sin does not offend God. Okay, so someone who does know, okay, that knowledge could be greater or lesser. Okay. Uh, at a certain point, it's venial. At a certain point, it's mortal. You know, depending on your knowledge and your free consent. All right. Eve cannot claim ignorance. 
So that's for sure. Okay. Um, was the devil throwing her curveballs? For sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was not uh, a straight talker. He was very subtle. Okay. But remember, you're talking to a woman who is in the state of justice. She's got great clarity of mind, you know. Um, so we don't know all the details, all of the dynamics. You know, we don't even know it perfectly within ourselves, right? Much less what happened with Eve. Um, but we can affirm that she was not invincibly ignorant, okay? That she was gravely culpable, that she committed a mortal sin. So she had sufficient knowledge and gave sufficient consent. That she was what? Uh, that she was maybe committing venial sins and then that built up to more immortal sins. That's a theory. That's a theory that she weakened herself um, by, by venial sin. Right. Right. Yeah, usually it's not the case that, you know, someone in the state of justice would willy-nilly fall into mortal sin. So it makes a lot of sense to presume that the dynamics involved were gradual, mm -hmm. right? And this is also what the spiritual theologians teach, that uh, the, the pious, devout person um, doesn't fall into a mortal sin all of a sudden. And it's compared to uh, boiling a frog. If you throw the frog into a pot of boiling water, he jumps out. But if you put him in the water and slowly increase the temperature, he'll stay in there until he dies. So that's what they say the evil spirits try to work on us that way. Slowly, gradually, subtly. And they say if there's one virtue that the evil spirits possess, it's that of patience. They'll wait. They'll wait it out. They'll wait it out. You know, they'll work on you slowly but surely over a whole lifetime. Boom. Just to get you at the perfect point. So. Yeah. Yep. Experts. I'm not laughing to laugh. This is like... Makes you think about when you get impatient and you start changing. Right, worse than the devil. I just had one question. I was, I was wondering, um, it stated that um, Mary had more faith than all men and the angels. Mm -hmm. Did her faith continue to grow throughout her life? Yes. Okay. So her spiritual life was basically on a um, trajectory like this, okay, uh, exponential trajectory. Because remember, with each virtuous act, we actually merit more grace. You know, we actually merit more grace. So our, you know, but the the dynamics in our spiritual life is one of oscillation. You know. Times of weakness, the pendulum goes that way. Times of strength, the pendulum goes that way. So, you know, for us, hopefully, the general tendency is one forward and upward in the spiritual life with regard to the virtues and grace within the soul. Um, but with Our Lady, she never, the pendulum never swung in the other direction. And so, I have this explained. I might be able to find it. Uh, if you give me just a minute. Actually, the same author, Francisco Suarez, explains this trajectory of Our Lady. So I just need to see if I can find this quote of his. Because it is beautiful. Here we go. So, Francisco Suarez says that the grace possessed by the Blessed Virgin in the first instant of her conception 
was greater than the grace which the highest angel possesses, who by one or two acts has perfected all his merits. Okay, so that's the angels. Remember, they had a, a choice to serve God, obey God, or not. And depending on that, they were either cast from heaven or they were then admitted into the beatific vision, right? Therefore, she merited more than thousands of men merit through their whole life. Wherefore, the Blessed Virgin in this, <clears throat> in this first instant loved and praised God with such earnestness of intention that she exceeded the love and consequently also the merit of the highest angel. So that's Our Lady's first act of love. Once she's immaculately conceived, it's understood that she was given use of her reason in the womb of St. Anne. This is a special privilege. She then made an act of love for God, which surpassed that of the seraphim, right? Consequently, this meritorious act of love in the first instant uh, then led to the second instant of her cooperation and love by means of the increase of grace, which in the first instant she had merited and had in reality received. So remember, she merited an increase of grace because of that act of love for God. She then doubled the degrees of love and consequently also of merit. And in the third instant, by doubling the same, she quadrupled both merit and grace. And so in every instant, by doubling continually the grace she had received until her death, in the 72nd year of her age, she had increased the degrees of grace and merit to such an extent that she altogether excelled in them all men and angels taken together. Wherefore, she by herself alone is more acceptable to God than all the rest. And God loves the Blessed Virgin alone more than the whole church that is, more than all men and angels taken together. This is confirmed in the revelations given to St. Bridget, chapter 1, or book 1, chapter 10. So, you know, this is Our, our Lady where she's completely off the charts because from moment to moment, She's knowing and loving God, meriting more grace, cooperating with that new grace perfectly, and meriting more. We want to strive to imitate her in cooperating with grace as best as we can, in making progress, in love of God, in love of neighbor, in humility, in faith, and all of these virtues that we're talking about. So, like I said, we are, you know, we are weakened by original sin. Unfortunately, our pendulum does swing the opposite direction sometimes, and we're wounded spiritually. Um, and for this reason, Christ instituted the sacraments, okay, to heal our wounds in the confessional, to strengthen us for the journey with the Eucharist, to give us final purification with the anointing of the sick. So we have a, uh, one of our neighbors here. Uh, some of you know him, right? Ed Mobley, his mother is dying of cancer, okay? Of bone cancer. So she's at home and yeah, she, she is on her last legs, right? So she received the anointing of the sick and the apostolic blessing. And it was very, very edifying, okay? Because she was just barely alert of what was going on. And in the end, made an effort to make the sign of the cross. Okay. That is a good reset. That is a, you know, what can you, 
want more as far as preparing for death goes, to be aware that you are being anointed, right? She's aware she's being anointed. She hears the prayers of the priest, probably interiorly participating in those prayers. So much so that she goes to make the sign of the cross, right? See, the, the sacraments are very powerful. And that's what prepares you to go straight to heaven. Any other questions on Our Lady's faith? So remember, with Our Lady, uh, it wasn't like um, she had perfect clarity all the time. Okay? She didn't. Scripture says that when she and St. Joseph found our Lord in the temple, and he said, didn't you know that I had to be about my father's business? It says that she and St. Joseph didn't understand. But it says she kept all these words in her heart. Does that surprise you? That surprises me. Um, no, it, not really, right? I mean, uh, her acts of faith become that much more meritorious when she's not given perfect clarity uh, in every situation. So, you know, I think our Lord um, probably dealt with his mother in that way as well. Uh, yeah, but also be a consolation for us who don't have perfect clarity, right? And, and be a model for us. The two combined, I think I kind of read something. Yeah. yeah. So she didn't have perfect clarity all the time. Yeah. So she had to go through... Obscurity, moments of obscurity, darkness, kind of mysterious. Well, that, that's human nature anyway, so I mean, she is a human being. She is, she's definitely a human being. But we always need to think um, she's not, she was not a fallen human being. So very different, very different in that sense. I, I remember one of our priests uh, Citing somebody else, actually. I forget who it was. But in any case, I've heard it said that Our Lady is actually uh, more not like us than she is like us. So, you know, if you read uh, The Mystical City of God, Venerable Mary of Agreda, you say, yes, yeah, she's <laughs> more not like us. <laughs> right? Just, you know, the name itself. The name itself, Mystical City of God, that's referring to Our Lady, that she is the mystical city of God. Okay. Yeah. And, and most of us... I agree with that. <laughs> most of us trudge along in the unmystical city of this world. Right, I mean... So... All right, any other questions about Our Lady's faith, her journey of faith? Very good to meditate on. All right, so that about wraps up this time period, and we'll continue next time with Our Lady's Hope. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Immaculate Heart of Mary, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.